This episode of The Tolkien Road is made possible by To Middle Earth and Back Again, a new companion journal and devotional by Caitlin Fascista of Tea with Tolkien. Chapter by chapter, grow in hobbitness and holiness as you reflect on major themes, quotes, and characters from The Lord of the Rings. To Middle Earth and Back Again explores Tolkien's Catholic faith and the influence it had on his writings, inspiring you to reflection and action as you seek to carry the spirit of Middle Earth into your own daily lives through journaling prompts, discussion topics, and tangible action items. Journey alongside Frodo, Samwise, and the other members of the Fellowship of the Ring as they each play their parts in the War of the Ring. And as they come to the final chapters of their tale, you may find yourself altogether changed as well. For more information, head on over to teawithtolkien.com slash book. Once again, that's teawithtolkien.com slash book. The Tolkien Road, Episode 150, Concerning Peter Jackson's The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey. Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to The Tolkien Road, a long walk through Middle-earth. On this episode, we discuss Peter Jackson's The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey. Before we get started, please head on over to iTunes and leave The Tolkien Road a rating and feedback. It's a great way to show your support for the show and takes less than a minute. You can also stop by TolkienRoad.com, learn about previous episodes, and say hey. Follow us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Tolkien Road, and on Twitter via at Tolkien Road. Thanks for listening, and enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Tolkien Road. John here, joined by Greta. Hola. How are you doing, Greta? I'm terrific. How are you, John? Good. Good. Special thanks to our executive producer, Sharon Burgess. And this is the first Hobbit film review. First. Yeah, Hobbit part one. Coming at you. Hobbit, an unexpected journey. Right on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Personally, I prefer an unexpected foreigner. Foreigner? Yeah, or an unexpected Boston instead of an unexpected journey. Oh, ha, ha, ha. I see what you did there. (laughs) That's my little (laughs) joke. I kind of like it. I, too, would prefer an unexpected Boston. Yeah. More than a feeling. Awesome song. Yeah. Um, Okay. So we watched, as we've done... With the Lord of the Rings, as we did with the Lord of the Rings, we would read the one book of the Lord of the Rings, and then we would discuss the film of the same name. Right. Right. The Peter Jackson film of the same name. Yes. So that's what we're doing on this episode. Yeah, yeah. We are, we have just finished um, the first six chapters of The Hobbit, mm-hmm. and they pretty much exactly correspond with Peter Jackson's The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey. Right. So we're gonna we watched it last night. Both of you we'd both seen it several times before. Mm-hmm. Um but we watched it last night just to get it fresh in our minds. Mm-hmm. And now we're gonna discuss it. We're gonna talk about now it. Now we're going to rip it to shreds. You know it. No, just kidding. We're not gonna rip it to shreds, but we're gonna we're gonna have a you know, what we liked, what we didn't like, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh what we thought worked well, what we thought didn't work so well. We're gonna do a legit um, review. You know, hopefully like sometimes I do the, we do these reviews. And on occasion, not a lot, but on occasion, somebody will uh, email or contact and say, hey, I think you were a little too hard on this episode, which maybe huh. maybe we have been. Um, overall, uh, as you probably heard on the Lord, with the Lord of the Rings episodes, we're pretty, like, we're pretty down with what Peter Jackson did. Mm-hmm. You know, we acknowledge, mm-hmm. especially with the Lord of the Rings films, acknowledge the the role that those films played in getting us into Tolkien in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. So there's no denying um, the greatness and just the, the cinematic achievement. Yes. And, you know, I feel, I mean, I'd read The Hobbit before I, I saw the Peter Jackson movies several times. Um, and, you know, I'm thankful for The Hobbit films. Like, I, oh, I yeah, think they're, totally. I think they're good. Um, but, yeah, you know, so this we're going to talk about them, and we're going to 
we're going to tell you what we think is good and what we think is bad and, and maybe some other interesting stuff as well. So, and Sounds feel good. free, feel free to agree or disagree with us. Yeah. Feel free. Yeah. I mean, if you want to send us correspondence, that's awesome. I love the correspondence. We do. And it could be that, you know, you're, you convince me that I'm wrong about something. Unlikely, but you could know. <laughs> no, but seriously, um, you know, I, 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 we do love hearing from, from everybody. Yeah, and so if you really feel do. like, oh, you guys totally are wrong about this, then feel free. Yeah. Let us know. Yeah. We love, we love hearing differing opinions for sure. Absolutely. Okay. So, and I didn't write this down in my notes, but I want, I want to make sure I say it before we jump in. I, I mean, this was a highly anticipated thing for me. The Hobbit, the, this movie came back, came out back in 2012. It had been nine years since the last Middle Earth film from Peter Jackson, mm-hmm. which was 2003's Return yep. of the King. Yep. It was, it was a huge fan of those three films. And, you know, there'd been a lot of talk for a while about doing The Hobbit, right? That, mm-hmm. that w- was, would, would somebody go back and, and do a version of The Hobbit? Because the only film version of The Hobbit that really existed was the animated version from, I believe, the late 70s, which we'll actually talk about um, much like after we actually finish the whole book. We'll do a, we'll do a review of that film because uh, oh, I feel like okay. it's kind of a classic film in its own right. Uh, not a perfect film, but a classic film, mm-hmm. nevertheless. But this was a this was a highly anticipated thing because yep. the the Lord of the Rings films had been such a big success in so many ways, and I think people wanted to see that similar treatment given to the stories of the Hobbit. Yeah. Originally, this is really this is interesting. I don't know if you knew this, but originally, um, Peter Jackson was only going to be the executive producer of these films. He wasn't going to be the director. It oh. was actually going to be. Guillermo del, del Toro. Oh, I think that's how you, that's I think I got right. his last name right. Guillermo del Toro, and he did like my name is uh, Totoro and things like no, that. No, 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 no. Oh, no, no. Oh. Sorry, you're thinking of the Japanese, the um, Japanese guy. Um, oh, his name eludes me right now. But oh. no, that's that's a that's a Japanese uh, oh, Japanese anime. This guy's not Japanese that you just mentioned. No, Guillermo del Toro. Does that that's a that's I guess a Spanish I don't know name. who he is. Oh, oh, Spanish. My yeah. bad. Guillermo? You never took Spanish, so I that's... I never took okay. Spanish. Yeah. But I guess it all maybe just sounds not... I think it sounded like Totoro to me. Oh. Maybe that's no. where my brain went. What's that guy's name? If you hadn't mentioned him, I would have I been know. able to tell you right off the top You'll of my head. You'll probably remember in the middle of the episode when it has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about. Yeah, anyway. And that's okay. No, Guillermo, Guillermo del Toro okay. is... Um, you, you, but you know Guillermo del Toro because do you remember the movie Pan's Labyrinth? Do you remember that movie from oh. like probably watched it ten years ago? But it was um, that's anime, isn't it? No, 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 no. It's like a it's like a uh, a live action fantasy film that take. You remember the it's the one with the the little girl, and uh, it's got that really creepy scene with the the monster that like has the the hand the eyes in its hands, right? The like. Where it like puts it has to put its like um, hands over its eyes and then it's and then it can see. I don't remember this. Well, we watched it. Man, I should have reminded you of that. We watched it a long time ago, okay. and we both really liked it. Okay, um, I'll take your word for it. I I was, I, so so all that is to say, um, thank you for that extra long rabbit trail. Yeah, no problem. Um, That's what I do. I th- I thought this would all be fresh, and I thought you would kind of remember. <laughs> Remember Del Toro, or at least what Pan's, Lab- Pan's Labyrinth I, was. I know the I know the movie name, yeah. but I, you know, my brain just not what it used to be. Well, that's all right. Your, your brain, your brain's fine. You just haven't <laughs> thought of it in a while. So, and I think about these things more, you know, more than you do typically. That's probably you're, true. You're a lot more of a reader reader than I am. I watch a lot of stuff too. Yeah. So I read a lot, but I you you read a lot more than I do. So you've had many things kind of going through your brain. Anyway, I'm trying to make excuses for Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> anyway, um, so Guillermo del Toro was originally supposed to be directing this film. Um, and for whatever reason, he decided to back away from it. Um, I'm not really sure why, but I think it maybe had something to do with... He, he's, he's always been a little bit more of a... Um, he's had, always had a little bit more of an in, independent and artistic streak. Okay. Um, to him, that, that sounds bad because it's like, well, Jackson doesn't have an artistic streak, but you know, sometimes sometimes directors are a little bit more artists than others, right? Did he maybe want to have more free reign? I think he wanted to do something that maybe the studio, and, and, and again, this is just a little bit of speculation stuff I maybe remember from that time period. I think, I think if you read between the lines, there was a little bit of like 
okay, like we like we like your style, Guillermo, but um, you really need to do this this way because this is what is going to make us lots of money, right? Mm. And yeah, we don't want people sense. being like, there's not enough, uh, you know, not enough battle scenes or something like that, right? I, I don't know. I don't know what the difference is he was going to do were. But I, I really loved Pan's Labyrinth, and so it was really disappointing to hear that he had backed away um, and was not going to be the one directing the film. So, you know, it would have been cool. Um, you know, maybe maybe in heaven I'll get to see what Guillermo del Toro's um, version of The Hobbit would have looked like. Um, but anyway, just an interesting little tidbit there yeah. that ended up going a lot longer than I expected. It to. <laughs> All right, so... Um, so the Hobbit is an interesting problem because unlike the Lord, like the Lord of the Rings, it's actually like the, the Hobbit is kind of the opposite problem of the Lord of the Rings. Okay, um, the Lord of the Rings was is so long and has so much depth to it that you can't possibly put it in, in even in three really long films, right? Right. There was a lot that was just left out of those films. Yeah. From yeah. the books, um, big stuff like Tom Bombadil and the Scouring of the Shire. Um, and, you know, arguably some, you know, other stuff as well. So, um, and, you know, it, is, it still ended up being all told, like 12 hours altogether, mm-hmm. right? Right. Um, on that note, I'd really love to see Lord of the Rings be a, um, I, I'd really love to see Lord of the Rings one day as a, like, not, not it doesn't necessarily have to be live action, but like a, um, like an actual miniseries version of, or, or like a multi-season TV show version of it. Um, that even expands to tell a little bit more from the appendices and everything like that. And yeah, I know they're doing the Amazon show, but that's not actually a remake of Lord of the Rings. Um, that's going to be like a, a prequel to both The Hobbit and The Lord, well, at least Lord of the Rings. I think The Hobbit as well, as I understand it. Um, but anyway, all that being said, The Hobbit is the opposite problem. The Hobbit is one sh- one book that is m- much shorter than any of the three books that make up The Lord of the Rings. Right. So how do you take that and can, should you just do one film or should you do two films? And originally, I think they were planning on doing two films. Okay. Right? Um, and then they started looking at all the material and they're like, well, let's do three films. Right? More money, more money. Yeah. So um, <laughs> that's a cynical answer, but I think there's probably a lot of that involved in it. Right? Um, I wasn't trying to be cynical. Well, I mean, it is. Like, I, I, I think it's just I, part I, of it. I, I think, yeah. you know, that's the cynical thing that people always run to with these things, with with these kind of issues, but I think there's probably a lot of truth to that as well. Um, you know, I think we'll wait, I think we'll withhold judgment until we watch all three of the films to say, you know, really did this need to be three films? Um, I remember the first time through watching all three, I kind of felt like, yeah, it probably could have been two. I think two would have been a good, you mm-hmm. know, would have been good. Um, but, you know, I, I think, I think there's uh, plenty of good stuff in this first one. Um, And it's an epic story. It really is. There's a lot, there's a lot to be seen. There's a lot to be done. Um, So, you know, I'm not complaining about that aspect of it too much, but it's interesting that the Hobbit is the exact opposite problem of the Lord of the Rings. Yet they both wound up as three films. Right. Um, Very interesting indeed. Yeah. So, um, anyway, so, yeah, I'm like I feel like I'm talking a lot. Yeah, you are. Okay, well, but it's okay. I'm happy to listen. Okay, well, you know, I will you're allowed say, to say stuff. I'm I know. Just I will say on that note, I think just the one, the first one. Yeah, I guess this was, the last night was not my first time through it, obviously, but even the first time, I thought it was too long. I thought the first movie was too long. Did you? I did. Yeah, well, I we'll, really did. We'll talk about that. I think it's probably a little too long as well. I. I think, you know, it's two hours and 40 minutes, roughly. Um, maybe closer to two hours and 50. I was going to um, say, that seemed, it seemed longer than that to me. And, you know, you think about the fel- fellowship, and then, like, there's... It could have been much longer if they had done all right. the stuff in the, right. in the yeah. book, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, this one, it's like, they really have to stretch it. So, there was a lot of controversy when it came out about the fact that they were going to do three, fil- like, three films. And people were like, oh, my gosh, they're, gonna, they're just, like, dragging it out. Um, you know, what are they doing? They're adding all this stuff in. Um, kind of, right? Kind of. It's interesting to note, as I brought up on this show before, and I actually looked it up this time, so I had my reference right, but it's interesting to note that um, Tolkien actually did begin to write a, 
a version of The Hobbit that was in the style of The Lord of the Rings at some point in the 60s, right? Right. And okay. I actually verified this. I went back, because so, I knew I'd read it somewhere before. And I think I actually saw it in Humphrey Carpenter's biography of him when I read it years ago. But um, it's actually, you can read a few chapters of this in uh, The History of the Hobbit by John Ratliff, which is, uh, which is available on Amazon. So um, you should go check that out. And we may, we may even look at that um, on a special episode as part of our walk through The Hobbit, look a little bit of that. Um, but it's not a completely far-fetched. That is to say that Tolkien wanted this story to be more too, like in, in, right. in later view. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, when agree. he originally wrote the Hobbit, it was, it was a standalone, like kind of thing outside his universe, outside the Silmarillion and, uh, and the rest of that universe. But he threw in a couple of connections and so it eventually became part of it, especially with the Lord of the Rings. Right. Right. Yeah. So, um, so I think there's some good stuff and some bad stuff with the, with what Jackson did with the expansion of the story. Okay, um, I think some of it's fair and some of it's pretty questionable. Okay, um, fair enough. Now, the way I look at those things typically is, um, for you know, stay true to the sources, right? Stay stay true to the sources first of all, factually first of all, right? right yeah, and then if you got exp- if you really feel like you got expanded or you feel like you got a great idea, make sure it's at least spiritually and philosophically in accord with what the author wanted. Yes, right? agreed. Totally. Um, so factually and then spiritually and philosophically like needs to be in accord with those things. You can't, I, I you know, where it drives people crazy and it drives the fans crazy is when a, uh, when a filmmaker just takes liberties, just takes license with the, with the yeah. story and kind of starts turning it into his own version of it. Yes. You know, yes. Um, now to be fair to Jackson, there's a lot of things that people complained about, oh, that wasn't in the book. But there's, there are, um, in, in, in the material that Jackson actually had to work with, right, the appendices to the Lord of the Rings uh, included, because he had the right, the fil- he had the film rights to the Lord of the Rings books already, right? Okay. Obviously. Yeah. Um, he had all the appendix material, which there's a lot. We did, we've done a couple of episodes yes. on that appendix material. Uh-huh. And there's a lot on the dwarves, and there's a lot on what happened in the, there's a timeline, a lot on what happened um, in the years, like to kind of flesh out the whole story of the Hobbit, mm-hmm, right, and mm-hmm. say like what, why this was important, why this wasn't just this little, you know, it, it seems at first like it's just kind of this like, you know, little journey and kind of kind of story all by itself, but really it has a much bigger place in the whole story of the Lord of the Rings yeah. and the One Ring and mm-hmm. Sauron and and all those sorts of things. Um, it's actually a very pivotal point in the history of third of the Third Age. So, to be fair to Jackson. Um, there's a lot of the things that he's expanding on that are with warrant. Like they're, they actually are hinted at in, um, in the Lord of the Rings. So, okay. so that's, okay. you know, so we'll kind of use that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll try our best to evaluate the different things that are added in that seem like they're added in according to that standard. Right. I think yeah. that's the best standard. I think that's the most reasonable standard. Um, if I was a writer and I give you the rights, I sold you the rights to my film, Right. And maybe I, you know, maybe like Tolkien, I wasn't the most like circumspect in how I arranged the contracts and everything, and kind of kept creative control over it. Um, I would be, and this is what you hear from writers. I, I would be, I would start to get upset if I feel like you're taking liberties with my work. Right. Right. It's yeah. like, wait a minute, that's my story. Yeah. I sold you the film rights. I didn't say you could rewrite it. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, again, me kind of blabbing on, but I think that's good stuff. So, um, all right, let's let's dive into the actual film now. Okay. About time. Well, why Jeez. don't you start? You've been, I've been talking. You're all like in my face about, come on, get on with it. So maybe you tell us what um, you liked. Okay, yeah. So are we going like, um, what's the word? Well, I think chronologically That's makes sense. That's the word I was yeah. looking for. Yeah, Just we're going in terms chronologically. Just story. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so I really, I did like the, um, the introduction. Mm-hmm. I like how it opened um, clearly, Frodo is not in, he's not a part of the Hobbit, right? Right. Um, so you like the frame narrative? I did like the, yeah. fr- I did like the frame narrative because I think that, um, the, I think it served its purpose mm-hmm. in kind of, you know, just assuming that maybe there's someone out there that's totally unfamiliar with Middle Earth and with the Lord of the Rings and with the whole background. Yeah. Um, I think it served its purpose in making sure that even a newbie mm-hmm. to Tolkien's world would be able to appreciate and understand. 
yeah. what was going on and be able to make some connections and maybe even whet their appetite a little bit for, you know, if they hadn't read or seen Lord of the Rings to maybe want to go back and watch those too. Yeah. Um, so I really did. I did like that. I liked the whole thing with the dwarves, mm-hmm. you know, the flashback to the, um, you know, to the, that big battle and the Arkenstone and yeah, all to, those to things. Small, and small small invasion. Yeah, yeah. And the people of Dale and, you know, kind of setting the stage. Yeah. Which is important. Absolutely. Because otherwise, like, there's no reason for this journey, right? Right. Like, oh, they lost their home and they want it back. Big deal. Yeah. That's one of the things I've always felt like with this film is one of the best things. I I think Jackson, one of the things he does well as a storyteller is sets the stage in his stories. Um, Mm -hmm. I've always thought that. And all three of the Lord of the Rings films, he did an excellent job of setting the stage. The, The beginning of the Fellowship of the Ring, like to this day is like still one of my favorite sequences mm-hmm. of, of film anywhere. It just, it's just grabs you, yeah. you know? Yeah. Like that was my first experience with Lord of the Rings is seeing that opening. And it's just like, I felt, fa- you know, I fell in love. Right. Yeah. And yeah. here I am, yeah. you know, 17 years later. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, he does a great job again with the, um, yeah, with, with Smaug's attack on like the story of the dwarves and then Smaug's mm-hmm. attack on Erebor. Mm-hmm. Um, weaving that back in to give it that more, you know, to give it that more epic feel. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I agree. That's, you know, I wrote down like, uh, love the opening. Mm-hmm. Um, I did like, you know, I, I also liked just the, the narrative aspect, uh, or the thematic aspect of setting the stage with, um, Thror's greed. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I think it's interesting this this notion and I don't I can't I'm not sure whether it's actually Tolkienian or not. I think it might be that Thror's greed somehow attracts like spiritually attracts Smaug, right? Hmm. Um and I, I thought that was a very like interesting notion that's really highlighted in the film that he gets greedy, mm-hmm. right? Um and he starts just being like so happy with all of his wealth and then smile comes. You yeah. Know, I thought that was really, I thought that was really cool. It doesn't, I mean, they talk about Smaug in the, in the beginnings of the Hobbit mm-hmm. and don't they, don't they, isn't there something like that? I mean, they kind of explain yeah. what attracted him. Right. And it was like, you know, he was, I don't yeah, know. I'm, I'm, were, I'm not arguing that it's not in there at all. I'm saying like, I think, um, I think it'll be, I, I, it's a no. it's just a thematic note, like kind of a subtle note that, I appreciate it, and it'll be interesting to Got evaluate it. it as we get further on. Cool. Whether yeah. it, whether it is a, it's in accord, you know, mm, um, mm-hmm. with the story. I think it is. I just I, hadn't I really thought of it before. I think it is. I think it is too. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that was the only thing that summoned him, the dragon, but mm-hmm. I think it definitely had a part. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I think so. We move on from the opening. You good moving on? Is there something else you want to say about uh, yeah, the Yeah, no, the it's just, is not only is it, um, you know, does a good job of kind of creating a framework and, um, you know, a good foundation. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, it's just not just the opener, but the entire movie. I mean, it's just, it's a, uh, it's just beautifully, you know, like, it's yeah. just stunning. The music, the scenery, the, mm-hmm. filmo- the filmography. I mean, it's just the cinematography. cinematography. yeah. I'm not a, I'm not a filmmaker. I don't know all the lingo. But yeah, I mean it's it's just amazingly done. Yeah. I mean, like I just remember the in that opener, the scene that kind of sticks in my mind is when they're the dwarves, you know, in um what's the name of the, their kingdom again? Uh Erebor. In Erebor and yeah. how they're mining all those jewels and you just like there's the ropes like mm-hmm. with the shining jewels like being pulled out of the depths of the mine and it's just right. like I don't know, it's just it truly is a cinematic achievement with yeah. all the, you know, I mean, it really is a feast for the eyes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I, uh, I highly enjoy it. I highly enjoy the opening as well. Yeah. Um, chapter one, mm-hmm. um, I thought, I think chapter one is done extremely well uh, in the yeah, movie. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I mean, the whole, like, it's it's such an iconic chapter in so many ways. You've got the just the opening lines. You've got Bilbo and Gandalf's first interaction. Yeah. Um, Can we just got, give a shout out to Martin Freeman? Oh, I, I do. Mean, I, I could mean, there yeah. be like a better Bilbo? Yeah. I, I had, don't think so. I had that on my notes. Um, I, I like Martin Freeman as Bilbo. I really mm-hmm. like, there's nobody I could think of that would, no, would, do that would be a better, better Bilbo no. um, than Martin Freeman. He's yeah, just yeah, exactly really like reading 
the book, you know, you're just yeah. like, it's a, yeah, that's him. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so, and, it, and it, I think it's really cool how I really do think that Ian Holm, who plays the older Bilbo, both in Lord of the Rings and in The Hobbit, um, I think it's, I, th- I can see like the continuity, like that, that Ian Holm oh, would be yeah. an older mm-hmm. Bilbo mm-hmm. or would be an older Martin Freeman. Yes. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's not perfect, but it's like, I can see, they don't look radically, you know, sometimes you see a movie where they do that and it's like, the two care the two people look like radically different and i mm-hmm. think um mm-hmm. you know i think they look like they could be the same person just yeah. at different ages yeah you know? agreed and even frodo and bilbo like you know even though martin freeman oh there's a resemblance yeah, yeah. They're, they're not related in real life but you could see where well and they're not they're not um i mean they are blood relatives they're just they're not like um right exactly they're not father and son yeah. but you can see there's you know there's yeah. some resemblance so, absolutely so. yeah yeah it was well cast absolutely i agree um but Everything about the I feel like that's in the first chapter is done well in the movie. All mm-hmm. the stuff that I want to see in from the first chapter. Yeah. I was so glad that they didn't um like make it overly serious because there mm-hmm. is, you know, there's the just the it's a very funny chapter. It is. And yeah. um and I think they I think he did really well to balance it with the story. He didn't make it goofy, but he let the he still let the humor of it shine out. Mm-hmm. He kept the mm-hmm. chip the glasses and crack the plates yes. in there. Yes. Um, and and then he also does uh, far over the misty mountains, right? Which um, I thought was just beautiful. Yeah, it is. It's a really cool so little chant. Beautiful, yeah. That they do. Um, so I, you know, I don't know that I have much more to say about the chat about that than just like I really enjoy the opening, the the first chapter. Yeah. I think they did a great job with the first chapter. I agree. Um, trying to think if there's any highlights in, in particular, but you know, it just, I think they nailed it. So I think it's funny. You're just thinking about the, um, it's the, we meet all the dwarves in the first chapter. Mm -hmm. And, um, I just think it's so funny that, you know, most of them obviously look how you'd expect dwarves to look, you know, they're short, they're chubby, they're not especially attractive. And then you have Feely and Keely show up right? and you're like, Hmm. Yeah. Obviously, they threw those in for the uh, the feminine audience. <laughs> I was just like, I yeah. thought that was so funny. I mean, I know they're like the younger ones, right? But I mean, all the other ones are like older, and they have the giant noses and yeah. the ugly they, beards. They, they look they look like you know more of what you'd think a dwarf would look like. Exactly. In these, and then, in these fantasy stories, right? But Keely, especially, you're like, mm, he could be an elf, like. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, they definitely. I think that was another thing that they were going for, and and I, you know, and I think that's because for a big movie, you know, for and we'll talk more about this when we talk about the Desolation of Smaug, the second movie, but and, and then the third movie as well. But I think they realized they needed some kind of um, not not just eye candy, but they needed a like a good. Uh, I think they wanted to have some kind of romance in the story, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. so they were setting the stage, you know, with that. Uh, you know, with that in the story, but yeah, there's the, the obvious, the obvious standout standouts. Yeah. yeah. Um, to the point, yeah, they don't. I mean, they barely really. I, uh, Feely looks looks dwarvish. Keely he does, but Keely looks like an elf. He does. Yeah. I mean, he looks like he'd even be related to Aragorn. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's he, like, yeah, well, I, that's probably better. He he. I don't know. That he looks like an elf. He looks like a he looks like a ranger. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he definitely doesn't uh, doesn't have the same dwarfish features, but I guess in the grand scheme of things, there are probably like really good looking dwarves. There probably are. There you probably know, are. Yeah, it's probably just one of those things. Yeah. So yeah, I'm not saying that it was wrong. Yeah. I'm just it just makes me chuckle. It is. It's funny because <laughs> you got like you got like Bomber and Oin and yeah. Gloin and then yeah. and then and Balin and then you've got. You got Keely. What's up, lady? You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, um, yeah. I got to think that that actor was like, "I'm playing a dwarf." Yeah. And he's like, y- "Yeah, we we need you to play a dwarf." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we need we need we need a dwarf like you in this movie. Um, okay. So, um, moving on from chapter one. Uh-huh. It's cool with that. Yeah. Totally. All right. Yeah. Cool. Um, second chapter. Uh, trolls. Trolls. I thought yeah. I thought the trolls were done pretty well too. They were done well. I, I was pretty yeah. happy with the trolls. Yeah, I was talking to our daughter about it this morning. She watched it with us, and she was, you know, I think it was the first time she'd seen it in a while, mm-hmm. and she was reminiscing how the how the when the first the first time she had seen it, I think it was in the theater. Yeah, I think, um, and she was pretty young, like maybe seven or so, and she says that she's like, I remember being completely 
freaked out by the trolls the first time <laughs> I saw it. And I was like, really? She's like, yeah. I was like, but they're kind of funny. And she's like, yeah, but they're, they're scary. Like, they're kind of, like, frightening. And I was like, she's like well, especially she's when I was younger. And I was like, I guess I can yeah, see Yeah, when that. she was younger, yeah, I yeah. can see that. I, I can't imagine she's that freaked out by no, him now. But she was, and she was just rem- yeah. scary no, but she was totally now. just reminiscing about how much they bothered her the first time yeah. she had seen it. And, what, you know, seeing them through a young child's eyes, you can see, oh, oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. They're, they're, they're kind of freaky. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they never get called by their, I don't think they ever get called by their, um, you know, by their chimney sweep names. I did hear one of them refer, like, I do hear the name Bill. Did he get, okay. Yeah, I did hear one Bill. Yeah. 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 Um, Okay. But I think they're well done. I think they're, they're well done. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, they, I think they're, you know, the humorous side of them Mm -hmm. is well portrayed. Um, And it goes pretty much according to the, the book. I always expect to see the talking wallet. I wrote that I like down I've in my notes. Before. I was like, what happened to the talking money bag? I was well, really like disappointed. I didn't remember that that wasn't a part of it. I, I always, I, this happens every time I watch the movie is I'm like, I feel like I remember. Wait, I there was a talking money bag in this movie. Yeah. Before the last time I saw yeah. it. So I think I'm actually mixing it up. You know what I'm mixing it up with? I realize what? now. I'm, I'm, I know it's in the book. My yes. mind knows it's in the book. And yes. then it remembers the sorting hat from Harry Potter, the Harry Potter oh. movies. Oh. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Um, yes. I think that's what happens to me is I've my <laughs> brain has mixed those two things up. Interesting. So I always expect it from because I've seen it in the Harry Potter movies. Yes, a talking know? object. Yeah, that shouldn't talking, be talking. Yeah, talking inanimate object. Yeah. Um. So yeah, just that's funny, funny little thing there. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay. So, so that was different because yeah. you know. It l- subtle different. I mean, I'm, yeah. I don't get hung up on little differences like yeah. that too much. Um. I mean, I think it would have been cool to see it. To see the actual talking wallet, um, I don't. I think I probably prefer that to the uh, to using Bilbo as a as a handkerchief, as a handkerchief which was yeah, gross, that's super gross, <laughs> super duper gross. But um, no, I'm, but I, I'm just not a big fan of gross out humor. So yeah, um, that's not. I mean, it's not terribly. It's not like it's all like all goopy and disgusting. But it's like it's gross enough. It is anyway, gross enough. Yeah, uh, but not a big deal. Not something I'm really. Hung and up also on. in that scene. Um, it was Bilbo. Yeah, that did the stalling instead of Gandalf doing the ventriloquist act. That's true. That's true. Which I was—I mean, I think that's funny. Yeah, like I—I I don't mind it. I think Bilbo is really funny. I think he. And I think I like, he is. You know, I—I li- I like that. I, I agree. I don't think that was a huge. I mean, it was a bit of a departure, but it, you know, it worked. Again, an- another little departure that I'm not terribly hung up on. Right. Um, right. I, yeah. It, for me, these movies and and and. Using a, a, a writer's stories, it does not have to be a word-for-word uh, depiction of of the book itself. In fact, I mean, I know that's really kind of impossible with a lot of books. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it's when you get start getting into big stuff. And that leads me to the next couple of points, which are things that we've kind of got to discuss and okay. talk about how we feel about these things. Yeah. The first is Azog. Is he the white orc? The white orc, yeah. Okay, um... Yeah. The, is he in this? I meant to look this up beforehand, but I didn't. Is he like in the Silmarillion or somewhere? No, he's he is mentioned in the first chapter of The Hobbit. He's mentioned oh. uh, briefly, actually. Okay. Um, it says, here, let me get my copy here. It says, um, when uh, Gandalf is talking about how he came, uh, let's see. It says, I've often wondered about my father's and my grandfather's escape. I see now they must have had a private side door, which only they knew about. But apparently they made a map, and I should like to know how Gandalf got hold of it and why it did not come down to me, the rightful heir. I did not get hold of it. I was given it, said the wizard. Your grandfather Thror was killed, you remember, in the mines of Moria by Azog the goblin. Curse his name, yes. Oh, so, okay. Um, so it, it, it's right that Azog kills Thror. Mm-hmm. Um, however... Here's the problem. In Appendix A of Lord of the Rings, where it has all this other history, the dwarves and, and, other, and other aspects, it actually talks a little bit more about Azog. Okay. Right? Okay. And do I have it here? Yeah, here we go. All right, here's what it says in Appendix... I'm sorry, it's Appendix B? Is that right? No, append- it is Appendix A. It's where it's, uh, it's about the dwarves. And it says, um, 
Up the steps after him leaped a dwarf with a red axe. It was Dane Ironfoot, Nine's son. Right before the doors, he caught Azog, and there he slew him and hewed off his head. This is before the stories of the Hobbit, right? So, so Azog should be dead. Azog, Azog is dead in the story of, in, in, in the actual um, stories of Middle Earth that Tolkien wrote. I'd say that's a problem. Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, so that, you know, it's like we just take the liberties with leaving Azog in there. Mm-hmm. Now, why did Jackson do this? Well, I think he, want, he, needed, he felt like he needed a, um, since Smaug wasn't going to be in this first version of the film, he felt like he needed a, a solid orc antagonist, right? He felt like he needed a good villain. He needed a good, um, it doesn't have to be an orc, but he needed a good antagonist, right? Mm-hmm. He needed a good villain. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Well, did but you that, need to contradict what's already in the stories of Tolkien? Right. That's, that's kind of the question. And aren't there plenty of villains in the story? Like, even... If he, I mean, maybe he just wanted one central one. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Because, I mean, the trolls are villains. The orcs are villains. Like, yeah. Gollum's a villain. I mean, you know, there are villains. It's not like mm-hmm. it's a villain-free story. Right, yeah. I mean, I mean there's, there's opportunities for other villains in this story. Um, so, it's just a... It's a head-scratcher. And, you know, because I do this, I'm... I'm thinking now, well, was was this episode where Dine kills Azog, was it actually after um, the stories of The Hobbit? I'm trying to see if I can get a fix on that as I'm, I'm trying to do that live to make sure I'm right that Azog was actually dead. Um, I believe he was. My gut tells me he was, but I could be wrong about that. But just to be sure, let's see. Um, all right. 2799. Battle of Nan Du Hirion before the East Gate of Moria. Dine Ironfoot returns to the Iron Hills. Let's see if that was the battle we're talking about. That's 2799. Uh, let's see. I feel like I need to. Yeah, just start talking, talk say something. Something. We could play the James song. Something say something. You. Say something. Yeah, well. Anything. Okay, well, I, I'm almost 100% certain that's the, that's the case, that Azog died a long time before the, the story of The Hobbit actually happens. If I am incorrect about that, then forgive me. But I think, you know, we can still have a conversation about this. Uh, well, let's assume that I'm correct. And if, and if I will set the record straight if somebody corrects me on this. But uh, pretty sure Azog, based on that, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. is dead well before the story of The Hobbit. Um, so... You know why couldn't you have found another villain that you know, you could have made one up, right? You could have like taken just had it been another orc, right? Mm-hmm. Another orc chief. Yeah. Right. And he's actually named Azog in the film. Maybe it I was. I can't remember. Maybe it was. Uh, yeah, he's named Azog in the he, film. He yeah. is okay. Uh, maybe it was Azog's brother. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, I, like avenging his death. Right, avenging his death. Um, I, but I just don't even see the need. I just don't. I mean, yeah. you have the Goblin King. You yeah. have, you know, the scary wolves. You have, you know, like the trolls. I mean, enough is enough. I don't yeah. think you need another one. Well, and I think a little bit because I, if I, you know, I've only seen the uh, third Hobbit film one time and it's been a while. I don't think I've even seen I it. I don't think you've seen it. No. But I think if memory serves that he's kind of setting the stage for the third, there's like a kind of a big climactic battle with that involves Azog in that okay. film. Um, so I think it was a little bit of setting the stage for that as well across the, all three films. But yeah, you don't have it in The Hobbit, so it's like what is, you know, what is the real strong need here? Yeah. There's enough bad guys yeah. as it stands. Yeah. Um, and in The Hobbit itself, you don't have a villain, a grand villain that like goes across the sweep of the book other than Smaug. Right. Um. So, yeah, it just seems like... You don't really need to add uh, so, to Smaug. So I'm not going to, like... Azog, is, Azog exists, but I just don't like the fact that he contradicts Tolkien's right. own story. Not being true to the source. Yeah. Yeah, and I just... I didn't... I really didn't think it added anything. Yeah. Like, I'll be honest. I really don't think it did. I felt like it just made it a little longer. It did. You know? And it was, like I said, I thought it was too long. And yeah. that's one of the reasons. That was one of the things I could have definitely done without. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. We agree on that. We agree on that. Boom. Yeah. 
If anyone thinks it's awesome and necessary, let us know. Yeah, make a and case. And tell us why. And yeah, please do correct me if I'm wrong about the timing on it, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. Um, okay, next. Uh, and this we're still pretty much in chronological order with these things. Radagast. Radagast. Okay. Why? <laughs> so I was really excited when I heard Radagast was going to be in the movie when I first heard that he was way back in, before okay. the movie had come out. Because um, I, you know, he, he obviously... There was enough in the legendarium about Radagast to know that he was he he could reasonably be involved in this story. Okay. On, on kind of the peripheries of it. Okay. Right. It's like cool. I'm I'm excited to see like another wizard. So this know? let's be clear. This is still a, an expansion. Yes. To the Hobbit, but it could work given the uh, timetables and all that. Absolutely. Yeah. Like Radagast. Um, Rad Radagast exists. Mm-hmm. Um, and. You know, he, he does, we know he lives in like that general area, the kind of the Greenwood, Mirkwood area, okay. right? That's where he dwells and, and keeps, in fact, I think, it, I think there are part, there are aspects where he talks about that he's assigned, he's kind of there to keep an eye on Dol Guldur, right? Okay. The, the, the place where the necromancer, the mm-hmm. Saur, Sauron eventually comes back, right? Okay. So I don't have a problem with him existing in the story and actually being a part of this film. Like that, that to me is like, okay, you're dealing with good expansion there. Mm-hmm. But I really don't like the way he's portrayed. Yeah, he's kind of a bumbling idiot. I know. Yeah. I'm like, this, this seems like, I, he, he seems like a, a weird, like kind of hobbit dwarf goofball. And he's you know? got moss on the side of his face, I know. which is just gross. It's, it is weird. It's, yeah. It's a little too much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm like, okay, first of all, he's a Maiar. Right. Right. Yes. Uh, like the other wizards. Mm-hmm. And then you've got Gandalf and Saruman, who are bosses. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. they are like you wouldn't want to mess with them. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And then you've got this little kind of guy walking around, and it's Radagast. Mm-hmm. And I know that Saruman and the stories like kind of pokes fun at him, and there's questions about like what you know what kind of whether Radagast is is doing what he's supposed to do as a, as a wizard and everything like that. But I think they take that, those kind of questions to an extreme in the portrayal of him. Um, I just like, he, he almost comes off like some kind of like Disney character. Agreed. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, instead of a, instead of a wizard, instead mm-hmm. of like a, an Istari, mm-hmm. instead of a wizard on the caliber of, Saruman and Gandalf. One quick note: I do like the part. I do. I did think it was really funny how they handle the blue wizards in the story because they say when Gandalf is like walking along and he's like, and then there's the blue wizards, and I can't remember. I, he's like, and their names escape me at the moment because because <laughs> they never actually Tolkien never actually right, named he never them, names right? them. Yeah. So I li- I did like that little that little nod to the the kind of the the deeper parts of the legendarium, but uh, but Radagast just doesn't work for me. Yeah, me neither. Um. And the thing that the the cherry on top of it all with Radagast is where he winds up. He somehow first the 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 rabbits pulling the sled kill me. Um, <laughs> I'm just like this is so stupid. Um, I think Disney is a very good way to. Well, yeah, it's just like they and then they decided to put this Disney character mm-hmm. in there. You know, mm-hmm. um, you know and. Well, Disney care. That means a lot of things. But I'm talking about kind of like classic Disney movies, right? Like, and they just decided to insert this like goofball Disney character that's going to appeal mm-hmm. to little kids. Mm-hmm. Okay, like it's a it's a story for little kids. Okay, well, I get that. But is it really like would Tolkien have liked the portrayal of Radagast? I don't. I, I have a don't hard time so. believing he would yeah. have. I think he could have gotten behind Saruman and Gandalf in a lot of ways. Now he might have. I'm sure he could have. Nit, he would have nitpicked things. Yeah. yeah but. Yeah. I think he would have been like, okay, but but Gandalf overall, like you did a pretty good job. Like he looks like I'd maybe would envision Gandalf, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Saruman, same thing. They carry themselves the way I expect them to. Radagast, yeah. I just don't see it. I know yeah. Tolkien didn't give us a lot to work with, but it's like, I think you have to. I think you have to hew kind of close to what we do have. Yeah. In the other wizards, um, and. It, it that just bugs me. So you've got the you've got the rabbits pulling the sled first of all, and then somehow Radagast 
winds up on the other side of the Misty Mountains, five minutes later, from Mirkwood. These are the Misty Mountains that Gandalf is somehow, it's always a huge pain for him to get over, right? Mm -hmm. In this movie, he has to go through the, you know, he has to go up the mountains and across, you know, face these stone giants, and he gets attacked by orcs Mm -hmm. with the dwarves, right? And, uh, And then in the Fellowship, they're not able to cross them directly. They have to actually go through the mines of Moria. But Radagast, with his with sled rabbits. pulled by rabbits, is somehow able to just kind of hop over him and go right back as he pleases. Well, you know, those are special what? rabbits. They're special rabbits. The H-E double hockey sticks. <laughs> well, they, these rabbits have a special To keep name. it family friendly, because we're talking about Disney here. They're so. a special breed of rabbits. I forget what he uh, refers to them as. But I don't care. Anyway. Like, I'm just again, saying, maybe they're supernatural show rabbits. Me, show me where that is Maybe they can fly. Maybe they're like <laughs> they're hybrid <flying>. reindeer rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> That's something I would have liked to see, is the, fly, is the, 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 fly and the r- flying rabbits. Yeah. Yeah. I said flying reindeer rabbits. Flying reindeer hybrid. rabbits. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't like that part either. I think you've probably expressed yourself. Well, sing, you know. that, is, that is the most frustrating part of the film for me, because okay. you took a character that... It could have been a really cool aspect of this film, mm-hmm. and it's a, it's a, it's one of those characters that we knew very little about from Tolkien himself. Mm-hmm. And so, if you're going to mess with him, if you're going to include him, you'd better do a good job. Yeah, and go by what, and and and, what, and, by the and not just do what feels right to you. Yeah, right. I'm just like, this is like, where where is the warrant for this? Yeah. You know, like how. How could you possibly think that you could look Tolkien in the eye and say you, d- you did a good job with this character? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, it's silly. It's also really sad what happens to the hedgehog, Sebastian. L- little Sebastian. Little Sebastian the hedgehog. <laughs> <laughs> little Sebastian. Oh, I, I think he ends up being all right, but it's really sad to watch. It, it is. It um, is kind of sad. And you know what? I wouldn't have had a problem with, with little Sebastian the hedgehog if Radagast had been more of a wizard yeah you know yes um i know i because like look that aspect of him where it's like he likes the creatures and you know he's yavana's he's one of yavana's mayar right so he's Mm -hmm. all about like the living the like the animals of the forest and and the the living creatures and that kind of thing that's totally that's totally good that's totally canon with tolkien but it's like just but everything else that you had to kind of fill in on you just way overdid it right Jump, jump the shark with it. So. Yeah, no, I would agree. So when um, when Radagast goes to Dogledore and he like summons mm-hmm. the necromancer. Yeah. Um, I, where, where, what, like, first of all, what was that about? And like, is that a legit expansion? Yeah. So the Dogledore subplot is actually is actually fine. Okay. Um, so that's all laid out in Appendix A and Appendix B. Um, and okay. like, uh, and Tolkien actually. Uh, they they didn't have the rights to use this stuff, uh, but it's it talks about the quest of Erebor and uh, in Unfinished Tales too, which we'll okay. probably talk about at some point. Okay. Um, but Gandalf like mysteriously disappears at different times in The Hobbit, right? Right. Yeah. 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 And and apparently what he was trying to do is, um, you know, he he's he's dealing with so like the White Council when uh, Sauron and Elrond and Galadriel. And Gandalf are all meeting in yes, Rivendell. Yeah, like that's not all. All that content isn't in the Hobbit per se, but it's all has background within the appendices of the Lord of the Rings. I see. Okay. Got also, it. all that stuff got is it. fair game. Okay. Like I've got no problem with any of that okay. stuff. Okay. Um, in fact, I think it's all pretty, you know, pretty solid the way they do it. So. Good. Yeah, I, I can nitpick it, but it's you know overall the big picture I'm okay. fine with. Okay. So good. 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 Um. All right, you want me to stop talking about Radagast, so I'm not going to go back there. Yeah. Um, I really don't have anything more to say about him either. I'm just kind of like... I was going to say, I think you've made your point. It's a disappointment. It's yeah. just a big disappointment. It's the most disappointing thing about maybe the, all of the movies for me. But um, And there's nothing against the actor or anything like that. It's just like they, just the, the way they have him written is, yeah. Prob- yeah. is hugely problematic for me. All right. Um, chapter three, a short rest. Um, I just have to say about this chapter, I'm fine with it. They did fine in the film. Especially leaving out the goofy elves. I'm good with that. I miss the goofy elves. You wanted to see the goofy elves. I wanted to see the goofy elves. Yeah. And I wanted to hear their song. 
I was very disappointed maybe by that, Maybe it's in the actually. extended edition. We didn't watch the extended edition, so maybe they got Goofy Alls in the extended edition. Yeah. I think that's right. up. I think that's even more disappointing we're, for we're, me than Radagast. We were watching it, and like when they walked into Rivendell, and the, the, elf, gre- the elf greets them, uh, and I'm like, tra la 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 I leaned over to you. Yeah. I would have liked to have seen the actual... I really would have. Yeah. I, that would have been fun, I think. I would have preferred that to, you know, if they had to add, if they had to do something, at least that's in the book, and they could have just left Radagast out. Yeah. Do, do your goofiness with the elves, not yeah. Radagast. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I'm kind of glad they left it out, but we'll, agree, we'll just agree to disagree on that's that That's fine. One. That's totes fine. I'm good with that. Um, chapter four, I thought the stone giants were pretty cool. Totally cool. I really liked the way they did that. Yeah. Although I feel like it made it, I feel like they they um, wreaked more havoc mm-hmm. in the movie than they did in the book. I don't remember being like that big of a deal in the book. Like they just seemed to mention them and like kind of see them from a distance, mm-hmm. but not actually get involved. Yeah. But I, th- I mean, it was fine. I didn't mind that. I really, I really liked that. I yeah. thought that was super cool. Yeah. Again, that's that's one of those things where it's like, yeah, it's not exactly like how it happens in the book, but yeah. uh, but it's got you know, it's it's an embellishment that I'm okay with. Like yeah. it's not. Yeah. Um, it doesn't big time hurt the story or contradicts, Mm-mm. you know, Mm-mm. like the spirit of no, the story no. or, or of Mm-mm. Tolkien or anything like that no. is in my view. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, the one thing about that chapter is Bilbo gets lost a little early, right? He doesn't get dropped by Dwalin uh, as they're right. running away from the orcs. He actually right. like, you know, they fall in and then uh, he gets left behind by everybody and, and starts wrestling with that. One so orc. he just, he just somehow just doesn't get noticed. Yeah. Right. I yeah. mean, isn't that how he gets lost? Like, mm-hmm. Everyone's running away, and he just yeah nobody notices him again. Like I I I, I, I wasn't too bothered by that. Um, yeah, I mean, not did that make a big difference one way or the other for me? Yeah. Um. So and then Gollum and Bilbo. Yeah, pretty good. I thought that was good. Yeah, I thought it was good. I yeah. think you know. I think again, I love. I do love the Gollum, mm-hmm. uh, Gollum portrayal that Peter Jackson's He's, come up with with Andy Serkis. Yes. Um, I think they really nailed that character, and again, in this early part of the story, I, I think they. Just that whole chapter and like the, the whole, you can see. You, I love the part with just Bilbo like having the pity. Yes, you know? that was really he's, lovely. Like yeah. when he's in, when he has the ring on. Yeah. And he's kind of seeing through that murky, reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it, it's it it's amazing to me, and I think it's I think it's a big tribute to to Tolkien first and foremost, but also I have to give credit to to Circus uh, and to Jackson. Um. It just never ceases to amaze me how, like, Gollum can be such a, a despicable figure, but, like, you also just, like, kind of w- want to give him a hug and, like, yeah. you know, help him. Yes. <laughs> you know, you, you find just yourself feel bad rooting for him, for him sometimes. Yeah. And you're In like, oh, wait, he's way. the bad guy. I shouldn't yeah. do Yeah. Um, that's, yeah. you know, it's why he's such a great character. Yes, absolutely. It's complicated. Um, and then chapter six, yeah. I mean, I thought it was, I thought it was good. Um, the end, you know, the end of the, uh, the end of the film. Yeah. Um, overall, I you know didn't really have any problems with it. I mean, you know, Azog obviously plays a little more of a role in it that he shouldn't have. Mm-hmm. But what you gonna do? We already we already beat the beat Azog into the ground. Yeah, so. yeah, we did. And I I do really like the way the um, the eagles mm-hmm. are uh, kind of make their entrance. And yeah, gotta love the eagles. Yeah. Um. So. Um. I got me. Th- it got me thinking about um, you know a weird thought I had. You know that the big thing that people always like to troll Lord of the Rings about um, is like, well, why didn't they just take the eagles, let the eagles fly them to Mount Doom and drop the ring in there? Oh right, huh? right, right, right. Huh? <laughs> huh? <laughs> like, and you're just like, you're an idiot. <laughs> you're um, missing the point. Well, it, it's not just that they're missing the point. It's like because Nazgul, right? It's because they would have known they were coming. Right. Right? Yep. It would have been the easiest way, you know, to for it to fall into the hands of Sauron. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, and also, the eagles don't work that way. They're just not, like, they don't just, like, do what you want them to necessarily. Right. 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 Um, but they did get me thinking about, like, well, you're a little bit closer, actually, to Erebor. I mean, they can see Erebor from where the eagles live. Right? They can see the Lonely Mountain from right. where the yes. eagles live. Yes, yes, yep. So it's like... I wonder if they did bother to ask the Eagles if they could just give them a ride. They could catch a lift to, uh, oh, to the Lonely Mountain. <laughs> I mean, it's still a long distance, and, you know, I guess um, 
you know, again, I th- again, the Eagles don't just kind of necessarily like do whatever you want them to. I think they're mm-hmm. there to rescue people yeah. when, you know, when problems are afoot. Yeah. Um, but they're not necessarily like your allies to do everything for you. Right. Exactly. And it would have been a long flight too, still. Mm-hmm. So, and you know, you got to imagine, even though the Eagles are big and, you know, it doesn't, you know, they, they save all these people, like they're not infinite beings. Like they've, they're going to get tired too, carrying, mm-hmm. you know, bomber on their back. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, but it, I think it's actually a more reasonable, <laughs> my point there is, I think it's actually a more reasonable uh, way to troll the story to ask, well, why didn't they just fly the dwarves to the Lonely Mountain yeah. since they can see it from where they live? Right. Uh, you know, I, it's a completely unreasonable question when it comes to Lord of the Rings. Yeah. So. I would agree. Anyway. Yeah. Okay, well, any other thoughts, Greta? No, I think the uh, the only other note I made on my note sheet was that the scenery is just breathtaking. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely breathtaking scenery. Yeah, um, just the colors and the you know the landscapes. Absolutely, just yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I would. Uh, it'd be really cool one of these days to see somebody actually like make a Google Maps version of like Middle Earth. Oh, you know? that would be cool. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, actually, like, to where you can just, like, zoom in on on things and um, just kind of see all these different spots. I think that'd be a really cool little project. It would be massive. Like, not just, like, a cartoonish map where you can just zoom in on a couple of places, but, like, a no kidding, like, you know, do the whole map using realistic scenery. Yeah. I think yeah. That'd be really cool. That would be very cool. Um, but I have no idea how to make that happen. All right. Um, I guess that's all we got. I think so. For this yeah. one. Yeah. Where's so. the music again? It's just... Music, awesome. fantastic, yeah. Yeah. Works perfectly. Using, I mean, using a lot of the stuff. Recycling right, from Lord lot, of the Rings. A lot yeah. of what was but in Lord of the yeah, Rings. But it's still, so, yeah. yeah, it's still a perfect fit. So uh, I guess final score, overall, uh, overall enjoyed it. Maybe it is, I think, a little too long. Yeah, I think it's too long. Um, we'll, we'll talk about whether it could have been done as two films later on after we talk about all three films. Um Big, big, good, good things are the first few chapters, especially, are done very well. Um, Gollum is done very well. Um, bad things. Azog shouldn't be shouldn't be the main villain, and uh, Radagast is just very frustrating. A caricature of himself. Yes. Yeah. All righty. Were you going to give a number or no? Oh, like a rating? Yeah, because I thought you said final score. Oh no, no, no! I uh, just kind of reiterating. Got it. The big things. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Yeah. I think that's a wrap. Sounds good. Special thanks to our patrons, our executive producer, Sharon Burgess, as well as Chuck Farnung, David Dickinson, Bill Richardson, Katie Knorr, Al Taylor, Joseph. Oh, I got to come back to his name. Michael Martini, Brian Orr, Emilio Perea, Eric Bissett, Kelly Knotts, Amanda Kaiser, Kate Watts, Daniel Delaney, Chris Loftus, Gianni, Demaya, Pear Brenner, William Sutherland, and Joseph, I'm coming back to your name because I, I uh, got in touch with him to find, <laughs> to find out how to say his name, and I remembered it, and then I forgot it. Um, he's a good sport about it. He's, uh, so it's Maimoni, Joseph Maimoni. There you go. I'm trying to remember that for next time. Uh, he's a good sport because he says, I've heard it pronounced in so many different ways, and then, and then gives me the smiley face, so that makes me feel better. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, but we appreciate all of you all very much, and we thanks we appreciate all our listeners as well. Oh yeah, totally. Um, thank you for listening, and we will talk at you next time. Indeed, we will. Thanks, guys. Bye bye. Bye y'all. Please remember to check out TrueMyths.org and TolkienRoad.com for show notes and plenty of other Tolkien goodness. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, please leave the Tolkien Road rating and feedback on iTunes or your podcast app of choice, and stop by our Facebook page to say hey. On the next episode, we'll take a close look at Gollum. Please send correspondence to Tolkien Road Podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and until next time, the road goes ever on.